we won't be quiet. We're going to shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We're going to shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the joy. Our joy should be in this place. And we won't be quiet. We're going to shout out. Oh. 
morning. I saw, we all know the scripture, but I saw it. God part the seas. So I don't know who this is for, but all hell's raging all around you. And I could feel it, but this is what I saw. God went, <laughs> and he made a path for you to walk straight on through. What I'm asking you is that your faith rise up. Because what God did then, he is doing now. Because we saw it. So grab a hold of that right now. Just see it. God parted it for you to walk through. I won't forget the wonder of how he brought deliverance. The exodus of my heart You found me, you freed me Held back the waters for my release Oh Yahweh You're the God who fights for me Lord of every victory Hallelujah, hallelujah You have torn apart
was three, his room walked through those doors that you have opened. Lord, we trust you. We love on you. We worship you.
Hallelujah. Give him a shout this morning. Isn't it awesome? He is for you. Amen. When we sing that, that just gives me goosebumps to realize that the God of heaven is for me. He is for me. I don't care what you've been going through, what's been happening in your life. He is here for you. And he's on your side. Amen? And you are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Isn't that awesome to think? Oh, give him a shout of glory this morning. Thank you, Lord, that you are for us. And you are for us, Lord. And we're your people, and we're going to go forth and build your kingdom and do the things. We're going to tear down the gates of hell. And we're going to let people know that you love them. And we're so thankful. Thankful for it that you are with us, and we will fear no evil. Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus. All right, Amen, Amen. You can go ahead and be seated this morning. Thank you, Lord. Oh, okay. Amen. Well, this morning. In our congregation, had the Lord give them a word. And they're going to come up now and share that with you this morning. So if I can have Vicki come up and share the word that the Lord gave her this morning. Good morning. So I woke up this morning, went to go potty, turned on my water, nothing, zero. Not a sputter, not a thing. Zero. Just got my uh, wheel bearings fixed on my van, and now my muffler is growling at me very nicely. So I'm speaking, God, I, I need your help. I need what? And he says to me, what are you taking for granted? Do you take for granted you just turn the water on, and there it is? I start my vehicle, and it's all okie-dokie. What are you taking for granted? Then the realization of, I can count on God no matter what my circumstance. No matter what my circumstance, I can count on God. He is bigger than any problem I have, any circumstance I have. He's bigger. I heard once, what if you get tomorrow, what you prayed for yesterday. Yowza. I need to be a person of faith, a fervent prayer. I can't take his relationship for granted. I need to be in the word. I need to be with him. I can't take that for granted. But I know, I know he's bigger than any circumstance, any problem that I have. Amen. I know somebody needed to hear that this morning. Just like that song we just sang, he's for you. And sometimes, you know, we don't see, we say, God, you know, it says in your word this, but I don't see it. You know, we look around at our circumstances. But, you know, the thing is, we have to just keep believing. That's our job. God, God's, the results are in God's hands. Our job is just keep believing his word. And do you believe his word this morning? Amen. Because I believe if you do, God will come through. I know he'll come through. That's my God. Amen. All right, are you guys ready to give to the Lord this morning with our tithes and offerings? Yeah. Amen. So I wanted to share a scripture from you, from you, for you, from Proverbs 11, 25. And it says, I want you to listen. A generous person will prosper. Now, I didn't say that. That's what the scripture said. And it said, whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. You know, this past week, we went out and we did our annual passed out school supplies. Yeah. We passed out, you guys know we passed out 295 bags to people and individuals for kids to go to school this year. Yes. Yeah. We had, we had 300 bags, so we passed out 295 of them. 
to kids. And I can't tell you the amount of people that told me how difficult it was hard this year to buy school supplies or to get school supplies. A couple people were in tears. Matter of fact, one lady, I was standing next to my wife. She came running out. We had already given her some. But her friend, we couldn't give to them because they had COVID. And, and they said, don't come, don't knock, whatever. We're, we're isolating. But she came running out to us just in tears saying, oh, they need school supplies. Can you give school supplies for them as well? And we were like, oh, yeah, absolutely. We gave them, we gave them three backpacks. And I mean, just she was just in tears because she's just like, oh, it's been so hard this year. We've had so much going on. But we were able to bless those people from Revival Center. Yes. And they knew that. And then I was with another group. Uh, Ryan Wisner with, was with us. And there was a bunch of youth with us. And we ran into a man who, uh, who just, he talked to us and he poured out his heart to us. And, and uh, how he used to uh, come to Revival Center. We invited him to come back and come back this Sunday to come to church again. And, and to get plugged in and... He was so excited because we gave him a bag to give to his grandchild because he didn't have a lot of money, but he could bless his grandchild now because we gave him a bag from Revival Center. So it was just amazing just the things and it, the, how much people were blessed this week from that. And you know, it's just like the scripture says, Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. You know what? I don't know about the people that were with me. They might have been physically tired, but I felt refreshed. Just to see people blessed like that. And you'll say, well, how does this, what's this got to do with offering? Well, you know, a generous person will prosper. Whatever you can find to be giving our time, your finances. It's a refreshing, not only to others, but to yourself. And when you give, not only will this money go forth to refresh others, but it will bring refreshing in your life as well. And you have an opportunity this morning to be generous this morning. So, as always, there's four ways that you can give. You can fill out an envelope. If you need an envelope, go ahead and raise your hands and the ushers will give you an envelope to fill out this morning. We got somebody up here that needs an envelope. You can fill that out and put in the offering plate. You can also give online. You can also give text to give at 810-202-0605. And you can also mail it in at P.O. Box 667, Cadillac, Michigan. Amen? Amen. So let's take this opportunity to be generous this morning. All right, let's pray over it this morning. Father, we just thank you for this opportunity that we have to give into, into this church, Lord, to plant seeds, Lord, that are just going to go forth to refresh people, to minister to people, to help people. And we're just so thankful for that opportunity. And we're thankful for the, the refreshing that does come when we minister to others and, and that we touch others' lives. And we're so thankful for it. And I know that this is just going to go forth and do great things. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's give Pastor a hand as he comes up this morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's good to see you today. We're glad that you are here in this place. Amen? And uh, I want to give you a little report on how things are going in um, our movement toward our future home and um, of Cherry Grove Event Center. And uh, just so you know, uh, we made an offer on the Cherry Grove Event Center and um, it was about a half a million dollars short of what they wanted. So they didn't like our offer and uh, didn't appreciate it at all and, and, uh, and said not to uh, make another offer until we offered them what they were asking, which uh, we're just gonna let them wait for a little bit because uh, we know that God has given us that property. Yes. And so uh, we're, going to be, uh, we're going to be waiting for just a minute on that. In the meantime, we also realize that we need a space uh, for us to be able to meet when it gets a little bit cooler. We know that we have some heaters here, but uh, that won't help in January. How many of you know that's true? <laughs> so um, what we are going to be doing is um, tomorrow, 
I'm going to be signing a lease uh, for six months with an option of another three months for the J.C. Penney building, the former J.C. Penney building. And uh, we are going to be preparing that um, in these next few weeks so that we can have a big back to church Sunday and you can invite all of your friends. And so tell somebody we're going to be in the J.C. Penney building and it's not going to be too long away from now. Now, just so you know, we are um, going to be needing some help to get that building ready, cleaning it, making sure that it's prepared and all that kind of stuff. And that kind of stuff will be happening starting Tuesday. I'll be signing the um, agreement tomorrow and then we'll be needing some help starting Tuesday. And even if you can come and just clean some stuff, that will be a good thing. And uh, we just appreciate that and, uh, and looking forward to what is happening in that particular way. Pastor Scott is going to be kind of leading out in that effort and we appreciate uh, his hard work in that. So um, I don't know about you, but I'm ready to take a move and I'm ready to take one move and another move along the way. The children of Israel moved from place to place till they found their place. And uh, we know where our place is. Uh, we believe that God has promised it to us. And uh, I'm asking you to do this. Would you do this? Would you pray that God would soften the hearts of the people that we're buying it from? And would you also pray that uh, that happens soon? Yes. The other thing is, is that um, there's going to be a need for some zoning changes that will take place there. We believe with all of our heart that God is going to work that through. But we're encouraging you to join with us in those prayer efforts. So if you can join with us in those prayer efforts, we sure appreciate that. And in the meantime, we get to enjoy this beautiful space underneath this wonderful tent. Amen? So look at the person next to you and say, that sounds good to me. I want to talk to you, um, I want to talk to you a little bit this morning um, about uh, when we find out in our own lives that we are not enough in ourselves. And uh, I'll never forget the very first time that I really began to to, to wonder about my own capabilities. We, uh, um, we lived in, in a house on Richmond Street in Lansing, Michigan. It was a two-bedroom house, and so my parents were in one bedroom, and us three boys were in the other bedroom. Across the street from us was the Mansell family, and uh, we thought the Mansells were extraordinarily rich. The Mansells had five children, and uh, there was Gary and Rick and Jack and uh, Debbie and Pam. And we thought they were very rich because they actually built an addition onto their house. Well, then I know it was because they had so many kids, they couldn't put them in, two bedroom, or in, a, in a bedroom like ours. And so they built this addition onto the house. And we would, I would look over there and I think, they are really rich. And then I knew that they were super rich when they bought snowmobiles. Now, how many of you know that is a sign of wealth? Or a sign that you're going to put your wealth into something that is going to be breaking down on a regular basis, right? How many of you have ever had a snowmobile that broke down more than it ran? Yeah. All right, okay. So the thing is, is uh, I thought, wow, they are, they are super, super rich. And, and Gary was older than me, and Rick was older than me, and Jack, Jack was one year younger than me. And, and we would have these uh, contests, and we would, we, would, uh, you know, we would run around our yard, and we would play... We'd set up uh, Olympic games, and we would do jumps and all that kind of stuff, and we would compete with, with each other along the way. And, and, and I'll never forget looking over at their place and thinking to myself, I don't think that we have enough money in our family. It just seemed like we were a little bit less than them. And that less than them kind of got at me. How many of you have ever been in a situation where you'd say, you know, you looked at somebody else and you thought, I'm not quite what they are? Nobody? All right. Some head shaking. All right. Well, you know, it, it, it begins to work in your head. And, and, uh, and I lived, um, I, I was part of a congregation that didn't preach too much on, on uh, what we could be. They preached more on what we shouldn't be. And uh, we, we had a lot of rules and we followed them and we signed uh, covenants to that effect, and that we wouldn't do these things, you know, and um, there was a lot of things that I grew up not doing. I didn't have a clue 
what it was like to go to a roller rink or to uh, go to a movie or, or to b go bowling because those were all sinful activities and so we didn't do any of that stuff. I don't know why it wasn't sinful to go to the ice skating rink, but it was, it, it was outside, but it was sinful to go to the roller rink. And so there's a lot of stuff we just didn't do. And, and, and there were times when I, I just wondered uh, about whether I was good enough, not talented enough, not smart enough, not strong enough, and not loved enough, not educated enough, not rich enough, not enough opportunities. How many of you know that every one of us have had times when we made excuses about the not enough of our life? Just don't have enough. Every one of these is an excuse, and it le each of them leads to the simple conclusion, well, if I'm not enough, or don't have enough, or can't be enough, then... The conclusion is, I can't win, I can't make it, I can't deal with this anymore. And so people grow up with, I don't know how many times in my life I've heard somebody say, I just can't deal with this anymore. I'm not going to, I can't live with this anymore. It's just impossible for me to make it through this. And this circular thinking leads us right back to, I am not enough. In the middle of it, you might remind yourself of all the things you're doing and hoping to convince yourself that those four words are not true. And while you think you're combating a lie, you will find yourself running to another lie. And that is this. I must prove that I'm enough. And so we come to that place where, where we're trying to prove that we are enough, that we have enough, that we will be enough, that we can make it. We are enough for people by pleasing them, enough for myself by meeting impossible standards, enough for God by being good. If you've spent a fair amount of time in your life just trying to be good, you understand what I'm talking about. Always going, always proving, always comparing, never resting. But you know what I always found out? I found out this simple thing. Outperforming my inadequacy was exhausting. It just wears you out trying to outperform what you think you are not good enough in. Oh. If you're like me, then what happens is at some point in time, you go to the Word of God and you begin to look at the Word of God and you're searching for answers. You're searching to find out what is there and, and what can help you. And so inevitably, if you've read the Bible at all, you'll end up, and, you, and you're wondering about not enough, you'll end up with this verse in John chapter 10 and verse 10. The thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. How many of you are familiar with that verse? Yeah. You've been down that road. Have you ever read this verse and just openly wondered about abundant life? And it seems like some other people have it and you don't have it. And you're still wondering about the enough factor. And, and, and maybe you think to yourself, well, maybe it's just that translation. So, so you look at the NIV version and it says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. You're thinking, well, okay, all right. I guess it might mean what it says, and, but, but then you're not quite sure, so you look at the Amplified Version. I mean, you know the Amplified Version just says things even louder. <laughs> it says this, the thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. <laughs> you're thinking to yourself, wow, it seems that Jesus came to give something that too few people are actually experiencing. And if you'd be real honest with yourself, as I had to get with myself, you would say, you know what? I don't think this feels as full, as abundant, as joyful as I was looking for when I came to faith in Christ to begin with. And there's a disappointment that sometimes sets in. If I were to take a poll this morning, how many of us are living life to the full? We might all be a bit disappointed in how successful the thief has been in stealing the full life from us. 
So today I want us to explore for a few minutes what you do when you discover you are not enough. Just not enough. You see, the discovery of inadequacy is a Kairos moment. And we talked in the past about Kairos moments and what they look like. You see, there's two kinds of time. There's Kronos time. That's where you're looking at your watch and you're saying, how long will he talk today? <laughs> and you're thinking to yourself, well, maybe we'll be out by such and such time. That's Kronos time. It's measured in seconds and minutes and and, and, and it, it's measured in days and weeks and months and years. And it seems like, even though it doesn't speed up or slow down, it just seems like sometimes there are faster times and slower times in your life. The chronos just moves on a second at a time. It does not stop. Then there's something called kairos time. And, and this is the kind of time that Jesus talked about in in Mark chapter 1 and verses 14 and 15 when he said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of heaven is within your reach. It's within your reach. The time is what, in other words, this is an important moment. Now I can tell you this much, it's a Kairos moment when your first baby is born. Yesterday, we shared a Kairos moment with, 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 with two wonderful young people, Malachi and Emma. It was a Kairos moment when they, when they said, you know what, I do. It was a Kairos moment. And they said, well, later on they said, we got to watch the video because it went so fast. We, we're, 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 we just want to catch it. A Kairos moment is a moment when everything could possibly change in your life. Have you ever been in that place? where everything could change. Yeah. Kairos moment is when somebody dies unexpectedly. Kairos moment is when you get that first job. Kairos moment is when you get fired from that first job. Kairos moment is a very important point in your life. At that moment, something dramatic can change. It can move in a different direction if you make a different choice. It's a fork in the road. It's a place of decision. It's where you must choose where to put your trust. A clear choice is presented in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17, and beginning in verse 5. And here's what it says. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. This is option number one. It's an option that many of us go to. It's an option that we find out fairly early on isn't a great option, but yet we think to ourselves, you know what, if I just try harder, if I pedal faster, if I, if I just do a little more, if I, if I just take a few more chronos moments, I can somehow or another get over that problem of not enough. And, and, and that's what sometimes we do. We'll, we will either draw strength from ourselves or we'll put all of our confidence in relationships with other people. How many of you know that people can sometimes fail you along the way? And the reason is because they're also going through the same thing of whether they are enough. They're struggling with the same thing. And so when we're, when we're given that choice, the Lord says, cursed is the one who trusts in man. And, and we look at that and we go, wow, wow. Is God cursing them? No. These verses don't say that God brings the curse. The truth of the matter is, is whenever you trust in the arm of flesh over the arm of God, you can count on the fact that it's not going to end up with the right result. That is where the curse is. The curse is found in the futility of failure. When we place our trust in our own limited strength and resources, we resist the need for God, and our hearts slowly turn inward and away from Him. It is a great <coughs> temptation to become self-reliant, depending on your own self, your own strength, your own way. It is a great temptation temptation. But I can tell you this much. Self-reliance will never, never take you as far as you need to go. It will always fail you 
at some point in time. It ends up with the futility of failure. When we place our trust in our own limited strength and resources and we resist the need for God, I can tell you what happens. When we become self-reliant, slowly our heart begins to turn away from God. But it does happen. It's not all in a moment. It doesn't happen all at once. But somehow you, you, you begin to find that your fervor, your, 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 your passion for God begins to wane just a little bit because you become disappointed in Him as you actually try and take care of things yourself. When your response to inadequacy is self-reliance, your life will not bear the fruit of godliness. It just won't. Instead, you bear the weight of the need to prove, to protect, and to perform. You see, success is temporary in the land of self-reliance. You may survive, but you won't thrive. You may fake it, but you won't ultimately make it. You can put on the face, but I can tell you something. Behind the face is a sense of failure and futility that can't be denied. This is the main reason that many do not experience true abundance. They're trusting themselves or others to give them life to the full. Is your trust in yourself? Is your trust in your friends? Is your trust in your family? Is your trust in your financial resources? I remember hearing John Maxwell, who was one of the great coaching uh, leader, uh, leaders of coaching, and, and he said, he could tell a lot about where a person puts their trust if he had five minutes to look in their checking account. Just five minutes. Where do you put your trust? No one lives to the full when their confidence is in mere flesh. No one lives to the full there. In fact, it says this. This is what God says happens. That person will be like a bush in the wasteland. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the earth, of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. No one truly lives in option number one. No one truly lives in that parched places. At some point in time, the, 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 the part of your soul that once was alive dries up. And you may survive a little bit, but long term, you will not thrive ever. It's just part of the way it is when you become reliant on yourself. I'm glad that he doesn't stop there, though. I'm so glad that he doesn't. Verse 7 says this. This is option number two. You've got to get this. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. When we don't run from our lack, but rather lean in on God, who has no lack, it's, it's planting our trust by the stream of living water, and his name is Jesus. When we put our trust in Him, amazing things happen. Just like the tree, we're in a frequent state of dependence on this stream. Jesus is the lifeblood running through our veins. In this place, we flourish and, the, and we bear the fruit of God's provision and power and peace. You see, we have a choice to make. We can view inadequacy as a disqualification that propels us to try, strive to be enough. Or we can view it as an invitation to lean on Jesus and let Him be enough. How many of you know that in northern Michigan, it's been said, if you have no building, you're not a church. I can tell you this much. We have no building, and we are a church. I said we have no building. Not yet. But it's already been planted. God's already prepared it. God's already yes. made a way for yes. us. God's already gone ahead of us. Yes. And made a way for us to have a place. But I can tell you this much. 
The church is alive and well. Why? Because in this season especially, we're leaning on God. Amen. We're leaning yeah. into Him. And when we lean into Jesus in our lap, our lives bear the evidence that God is working in us in good times and in bad times. We don't panic when we're planted in places where we come face to face with our own shortcomings. We lean into Jesus and we watch God do something we couldn't possibly have done without Him. Friends, when we come up against inadequacy and don't feel like we're enough, it can drive us to be self-sufficient or Jesus-dependent. Self-sufficient live lives say, look at me. Jesus-dependent lives cry, look at him. A number of years ago, somebody asked me, why did you start doing communion? Every Sunday morning. Why is that something you do as you gather together on the Lord's Day? At the time, I'd done quite a bit of study in the, on the New Testament church. And so I began to answer based on the things that I found. And, 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 and one of the things was the New Testament church, every time they gathered together, shared communion. It wasn't like, do we or don't we? It wasn't like it's the first Sunday of the month. It wasn't like every other month or once a quarter or nothing like that. No, no. Every time they gathered together, they shared communion. Through the years, I found that couples that were having marriage problems, if I would just give them the simple prescription of sharing communion with each other for a month, every day for a month, it seemed to work out the problems that were going on between them. And so I, I just began to, to, to answer, well, it's because it's what the New Testament Christians did. But I quickly realized, as I was even saying that, that that was not enough when this song came rushing into my soul. And it just simply goes like this. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. You know what communion does for me? It reminds me that I'm completely dependent on the blood and righteousness of Jesus. Amen. And I don't know about you, but I need to be reminded of that. Because every now and then, I have a tendency towards self-sufficiency. Maybe you don't. But every now and then, I have a tendency toward, I can fix this. I can deal with this. I can make it better. And, and every time I have that tendency, if I remember, my hope is built... I'm nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. I'm Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When I remember that, when I remember that, I remember that my sufficiency is always going to be insufficient. But His sufficiency is always going to be more than enough. Always. So this morning, in response to what we have heard today, we're going to receive communion. I want the worship team to come. I want those who are going to be serving us to come. And I invite you as you prepare your hearts for communion, to just say a simple prayer with me. I believe it's absolutely essential that we recognize, that we make sure that we know and remind ourselves on a regular basis, in Him I am complete, in myself I'm never quite enough. So, 
Would you pray this with me? I don't, do we have the words? We're going to have the words on the screen for this prayer or not. Okay, then just, I will say it slowly and you can pray it with me. Lord, a life that is free of needing you is not a life I want. Thank you that I can rest in the face of inadequacy because my hope is not in what I can do, but in the reality that you are more than enough. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. If you folks would come and turn that way, and if you would stand with me, I would like for you to come and receive the communion, take it back, and then we will receive it together. Stand and come.
that the chastisement of our peace, when you bore that crown of thorns on your head, that we could have peace. By your stripes, we are healed. And even though every one of us have gone astray, you have taken upon yourself the price and the iniquity of us all. So I thank you, Lord, for the bread. I thank you, Lord, for the fact that it represents that which was sacrificed for us. We receive it now, Lord, with gratitude, saying, You are more than enough. You can receive the bread. Lord, we thank you for the cup. The juice in this cup is sweet to us, but the price that you paid was that you shed every drop of blood in your body to cover all the sins of the world, past, present, and future. You even redeemed creation. So Lord, we thank you this day that your blood was more than enough. You paid a price. And that price is still working today to free us from the shame of sin. So we ask you, Lord, to bless this cup as we receive it again. And help us to remind ourselves that it's in you that we are enough. You can receive the cup. Thank you. Would you raise your hands? Thanksgiving to the Lord. Say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You're more than enough. Thank you, Lord. You're more than enough. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Let's sing it again if we can. Sing it again together. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Let's pray for people. 